everybody. God bless you. Happy Labor Day. Here we are. We are back for another Bible study. I hope I'm seeing the stream a little bit slow. Let me see if it's because I need to turn anything off. Uh, I'm still new to this. So I'm still trying to figure out how everything works. Let me turn this stuff off so we don't have any lag. Happy Labor Day. Oh, there it goes. It's better. Hallelujah. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Wow, so last week we had our first Bible study and um, I was overwhelmed by how many people really enjoyed it. Um, praise God, obviously the Word of God is so much fun to dig into and as you know, I'm studying the Bible. Hey guys, um, hey Jonathan. So um, yeah, I it's, it's just incredible. I had a few atheists actually comment, uh, private message me, DM me and tell me how one of them said that he's never been to a Bible study, he's never been to church, he's never even heard a sermon. He said that it blessed that that he said it was he said it was so interesting and that he wants to hear more. So praise God. I hope he's listening right now. Uh, we're going through the Old Testament right now, the book of Esther, one of my absolute favorite books. And I know that many as well are watching love this book. So let's jump right into it. Oh, and by the way. Tea time and Bible study. Um, I hope you have your tea ready. I think it's going to be so fun to have Monday and Wednesday, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time, get together, read the word, hang out, chit chat, you know, go through the Bible. I mean, such a time as this, Esther 414, such a time as this. We need to study the word, get prepared, tell the world. Uh, the Lord is coming back. The Messiah of Israel, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is coming back soon. Hey guys. So tea. Um, if anyone's wondering what tea I'm drinking, I'm drinking delicious passion fruit tea. This is the tea that I love. Adore, adore, adore. Um, yeah, let's jump into Esther. Hope that I didn't mess up my focus. Okay, awesome. Let's do a quick background. Esther, the book of Esther, one of my absolute favorite books. This is one of the two books in the entire Bible that is named after a woman. The other book, Happy Labor Day, the other woman is uh, Ruth. So Ruth and the book of Esther. Another interesting fact about this book, Esther is one of two books that does, that does not mention explicitly God the name of God, Yahweh. Anyone want to guess what is the other book in the Bible that never mentions God's name, Yahweh? I am or Yahweh or God or Lord. Okay, you guys got NKJV pulled up, excellent. What is the other book that does not name God? Anyone know? This is Internet Interactive Study. <laughs> um, okay, seems like, okay. It's the Song of Solomon. Songs of Solomon is the other book in the Bible that does not explicitly mention God in it. Okay, so just some background on Esther. Esther is an awesome book in that it's, it's brilliant, obviously, in the Lord delivering his people. It's a book of deliverance from God who seems silent, who, who is not mentioned in the word, not mentioned in the scripture at all. Uh, seems silent, but God remembers his promises and he remembers, uh, he has mercy on his people. And when he makes a promise, he keeps his promise. And the promise is to look out for his people. That the promise that the Messiah was going to come out of Abraham, that Abraham is going to be a father of many nations, of many, many nations, that the stars in the heavens and the sands are not even going to count how many are not going to be able, it, it's, it, there's, Abraham's going to have way more children than that, um, than the stars in the sky. And the reason being is because of the coming Messiah that, uh, that all the prophets were prophesying about and that it was going to come from Abraham's seed not seeds, seed, right? Isaac, not Ishmael, um, Jacob, not Esau. So the seed that was going to come is, is the Messiah that's going to save the world. And, um, and, and we're going to, so some of the main characters of this story is going to be um, Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai is a Jew who uh, went into Babylon captivity with when Babylon took over, uh, took over Israel. It was you know, the, 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 the Israelite land, so Jerusalem. And they actually took, the Babylonians, they took 10 tribes 
out of Israel and exiled them to Babylon. This was 586 BC. 586 BC. So um, we have Mordecai, who's a Jew, who went to exile, and there's Esther, who is his cousin his uncle's daughter, which we'll see, which is his cousin. And Esther is an orphan and she has no mother or father and Mordecai has been raising her in uh, modern day Persia. Well, not modern day, it's actually modern day Iran. When after Babylon exiled the Israelites out of Israel, they went to Babylon, that's where Daniel was. Um, and uh, and, and, and um, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and uh, then Persia took over. Persia became extremely um, prosperous empire and took over and defeated the Babylonians. And so this is the time, 100 years after, so this book is 100 years after the exile of the Israelites out of Israel. And after the Babylonians have been defeated, they're taken over by Persia. And the Persians don't really have an issue with the Jews. They, they, they don't. Um, but you know, they obviously, uh, there's obviously a man named Haman, who is the wicked villain in this book, who absolutely hates the Jews. And there, here's an interesting background story on this. How many of you guys know this, that Haman, who is an Agagite, right? Ag Agag was the king of the Amalekites, who King Saul was told by prophet Samuel to kill. So back actually, even in Exodus, Exodus 17, 16, God told Moses that he's going to annihilate the Amalekites because the Amalekites were the enemies of the Jews. They absolutely hated the Jews. So when King Saul, the first king of Israel, the first king of the Israelites was told by prophet Samuel to go out in, first, in, the, in the book of 1 Samuel, told him, told the king, Saul, you have to kill all the Amalekites. Uh, including the king and uh, Saul did not do that. King Saul uh, kept a lot of the spoils for sacrifices and he also kept Agag the king alive as a trophy. As a trophy and so when when uh, prophet Samuel said you know saw the king alive he said what are you doing? What are you doing? So he killed him. Before he was able to kill him um, you know he obviously had a wife and children and uh so here's what's interesting agag is the lineage of haman so haman amalekites hate the jews uh and obviously haman has vitriol for the jews it's 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 an ancient feud and when you look at mordecai he is from the tribe of benjamin the uh son of kish which king saul was a Benjaminite, son of Kish. It's the same line. Haman's line with Agag's, uh, Ag the king of Agag, and Mordecai, and um, and King Saul. So it shows you how God has mercy, graciously allowing Saul's weakness with Agag not killing him to be countered with Saul's own seed, Mordecai, hundred years later, a few hundred years later, to get rid of the ancient enemies of Jerusalem, of Israel, the 12 tribes. Okay, so jumping into it. So who else we have? We also have Queen Vashti, and we also have King uh, King Xerxes or, or um, King Ahasuerus. So King Ahasuerus is the king of the massive Persian empire that's extremely rich. Uh, we're going to see this beautiful symmetry, this beautiful, yes, thank you. Um, the Persians are obviously Gentiles and they're pagans. They were pagan Gentiles. So we also have to keep that in mind when reading this book because there are a lot of believers and, um, you know, who, who and you know, Christian leaders and even Jewish leaders wondering, well, actually not as much Jewish because, uh, you know, it, it was one of their awesome stories in the, in the word. You know, some Christian leaders wonder why this book is even in the Bible because uh, we'll see this beautiful Queen Esther what you know married a gentile king married a gentile king and assimilated to the gentile culture um you know being the gentile queen which which is against the law which is against the laws of moses jews are supposed to be separate not intermarry um and not and not assimilate to their culture to to gentile culture so uh but anyway 
gosh, it's such an awesome story. I don't even know where to start. All right, so let's jump into it. So that's the background. So there's, there's this ironic, there are these coincidences throughout the entire book. These ironic, ironic coincidences, ironic reversals. So the book is so awesomely symmetrical. You have, you'll see the king in the beginning, King Xerxes, King Ahasuerus, have, these, have this massive 180 day feast to show off his riches and invites everyone in the kingdom to come and hang out and feast and enjoy. And they were drinking from silver glasses and gold glasses and sitting on uh, couches that were lined with silver and silver bottoms, silver little legs, which is extremely rich. Um, and so it's, it opens up with this beautiful, huge feast. And the, the entire book ends with the Feast of Purim. You have, uh, you know, in the middle, you have, uh, so you have the sides where you have the two feasts. Then you have where Mordecai saves the king, where Esther and Mordecai save the king. And in the end, you have Esther and Mordecai save the Jews. Um, and then in the center, you'll have Esther's two, two day feasts. The, uh, two day feast that she holds and in the absolute center is where we have this ironic reversal of Haman who has exalted himself uh, with pride and uh, lacks dignity and principles and the reversal of Haman and Mordecai these arch nemesis this ancient feud and uh, yeah we're gonna just jump into it because there's so much to go through and it's such an awesome book okay here we go and here's my question, by the way. Do you guys mind if I, do you want me to read it, read the word, or do you want me to put on an app? Because I have an awesome one and uh, speaks very well and very clear. And let me know what you guys want me to do. We are alive, guys. So chit chat. Thank you, for who's ever moderating. <laughs> Bless you. Okay, I don't have an OnlyFans, who's ever asking. I don't know what that is. Okay. We'll drink some tea. God bless you. Oh, amen. All right, guys. I love tea. For anyone that knows me, I'm Russian. I'm half Russian, half Jewish. I love tea. Would be nice to read. Do you want me to read or do you want the app to read? The app. Perfect. Oh, thank, thank God. Honestly, like I don't, I don't like to hear myself talk. Okay. Amen. And I also, by the way, listen to our last Bible study and it was really clear there was no there was really no lag so thank God there's no lag amen okay cool human voice always better ah, okay how about we try it and let me know if you think what you think all right let's turn on the app what app am I using you might ask this app it's called the audio Bible this is a fantastic audible Bible book it is a dramatic audio theater with over a hundred you know, famous actors, I don't really care, but wonderful voices, the most incredible voices that have, that it's the whole Bible. It's so awesome and it's NKJV. It's all dramatic with all the sound effects. It's really fun. So let's get this guy going and we'll go through it and I'll pause it as we go and we will discuss um, some interesting details. All right. Audio on. All right, here we go. Jump to here. <clears throat> oh, you know what? Let me turn off my, I have my Bluetooth speaker on. Okay. All right, here we go. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the... Th Shushan, I forgot to mention, Shushan, or sometimes they also call it Susa, is the ancient capital of Persia. And, by, and again, Persia is modern day Iran. But back in, in during that time with King Ahasuerus, he was the king of Persia and Persia extended all the way from India to Mesopotamia. So it was a ginormous empire that again defeated the Babylonians and eventually had King Cyrus who told the Israelites to come back from Babylonian exile to rebuild 
Jerusalem and to rebuild Israel. So Shushan is the capital of the Persian Empire. That is where the king lives. Third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and servants. The powers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. And when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan the citadel, from great to small, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars, and the couches were of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, and white and black marble. And they served drinks in golden vessels. It shows you how rich the kingdom is. This king is showing off his riches and hes they're getting just smashed drunk every single night, 180 days again, uh, you know, golden cups and, and, and couches with silver legs, which at that time in ancient, in, in the ancient time, that was extremely wealthy, extremely, extremely rich. Something very similar to what Solomon, his riches in Israel, very similar. Each vessel being different from the other with royal wine in abundance, according to the generosity of the king. In accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory, for so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women. And so at th in ancient times, the women would have their own separate feast, separate from the men. And actually, Queen Vashti, um, to give you some reference and some context at the time as well, the queen rarely ever comes out publicly, rarely comes out publicly. Um, and again, she's separate with the women having her feast uh what you're gonna see is that the king gets extremely drunk and wants to show off his wife's beauty and demands that she comes out to show her beauty now at that time that was extremely disgraceful disrespectful for a queen to go and show off her beauty to princes and common people at the time um and if the king was not drunk, if the king was sober, he probably would have never asked her to come out because it was such a, it was so disrespectful to just show off the queen when again, she's very private. She rarely comes out to be like a trophy in front of common people and princes. She, um, you'll see her response. She says no. The royal palace which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zetha, and Carcass, seven eunuchs, who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown, in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, brought by his eunuchs. Therefore, the king was furious, and his anger burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner. So stop right there. So the king demanded the queen come out. Now, even though it was disrespectful for the queen to come out in public, you listen to what the king says, because if you, you know, that's even worthy of death. Um, at that time, you listen to the king. And we're going to see this difference in two brides. We're going to see this legalistic bride, Queen Vashti, who is this, um, who knows the laws, who knows, you know, how to hold herself. She knows uh, how she would be perceived. She cared more about how. Queen Vashti cared more about how she was going to be perceived than how than pleasing her king, who even though he was disrespecting her and she and he was drunk, um, and you know humbly come out 
and do what the king asked and just, you know, do a little twirl. And he actually wanted her to dance a little bit as well. Um, you know, so there's a difference between this, this legalistic queen and we'll see with Queen Esther, who was extremely humble, who, you know, did everything the king asked because he, she loved him. And um, she was a humble spirit. Again, this dichotomy of this bride of legalist, this legalist bride, bride of legalism, and bride of love, which is what we have with uh, our father, you know, through the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua. Um, we have this love, this relationship where we're happy to do whatever he asks, asks even if we look ridiculous. We, we absolutely look ridiculous to the world when that, that don't know God, to pray for people, to heal people, to tell people about the gospel, to talk about salvation. It's embarrassing to do in public when, you know, no one, people think you're crazy, but we do it out of love because we love him and we know he's real. We, there's no denying it when we're born again. We know the Bible's real. We know that the Lord is, is good and the Lord is real and he wants to save people, that there is a heaven, there is a hell. And we're happy to, we don't care if we look crazy because we do it because we love him. So that's gonna be the difference in the two queens we're gonna see. So let's continue. Toward all who knew law and justice, those closest to him being Kashina, Shetha, Admetha, Tarshish, Mires, Marcina, and Mimukan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who had access to the king's presence and who ranked highest in the kingdom. <clears throat> what shall we do to Queen Vashti, according to law? Because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus, brought to her by the eunuchs. And Mimukan answered before the king and the princes. Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will become known to all women, so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they report King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him. So the king, in his displeasure, wrathful, angry, he's drunk again. <laughs> this this happened in out of the 180 days, this was the, the last week of the feasts, the last week of the king uh, showing off to his provinces, to his princes, to the common people. This is the last week and again, probably so hungover from all the days of drinking and so drunk, uh, He's now extremely angry and uh, wrath and, and just total wrath and asking his 10 um, wise men what to do. And I don't know if it's 10 or seven, I, I forget, but he's asking his 10, uh, his wise men what to do. And his wise men said, it's kind of, you know, I mean, it's understandable sort of, but it's a little ridiculous at the same time. Like, oh, well, women are going to see, you know, it's actually not that ridiculous because it is true. The queen is disrespecting the king publicly in front of everybody, and it makes the king look weak. So he has to, in some way, respond. Um, and they responded by, um, you know, telling the queen to leave. She can never see the king again. Uh, they're getting divorced and making a decree that the man is the head of the household, telling women, you know, know their place and to not disrespect them. You don't, need, you, I, I, you don't need to make a, this is why I say a little ridiculous, you don't need to make a law about that. I mean, it should be given, you know, the man has, had, is, is the head of the household as a woman, you know, you, 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 he's there to protect you and you're, and you're there, you know, under his covering because he's under the covering of God and you protect the kids and he protects the kids. And so it's like, it's kind of ridiculous. You don't need a law to, to say that, but whatever they did. But she did not come. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Medea will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be excessive contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it will not be altered. 
that Vashti shall come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. When the king's decree which he will make is proclaimed throughout all his empire, for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. And the reply pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Memucan. Then he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province in its own script, and to every people in their own language, that each man should be master in his own house, and speak in the language of his own people. Okay, so, we're going to see the king hold a beauty contest to find a new queen. Um, and this is where we're going to be introduced to Esther, Queen Esther, who is beautiful. Ooh, I don't know why this is, wait, why is this cut off over here? Maybe I should do that. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Uh, why is this, uh, just move this over. Okay, here we go. Cool. All right. So Esther becomes queen. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan the citadel into the women's quarters, under the custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women. And let beauty preparations be given them. Then, let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. Okay, so there's this beauty contest that is now being held in the Persian kingdom. Um, these eunuchs or chamberlains are told to go to all these provinces, collect young virgins to be presented to the king to, you know, as a beauty contest. And their preparation takes some time, you know, many months, because they're not just preparing themselves, um, you know, physically in terms of, you know, their hair and, uh, and oils are gonna lather on themselves to smell delicious, to become purified, clean. You know, again, this is like pagan Gentiles. Um, but, uh, you know, to, to be purified, cleaned, and, but they're also being prepared how to hold themselves as a queen. Again, Esther is a Jew and it's, and actually Mordecai, we're going to see, tells her to not tell anyone she's Jewish, to keep that a secret. It was a secret that only Mordecai and Esther knew because again, she was an orphan. So you couldn't figure out really who she was. Um, and so she kept that a secret. Now, the women are also prepared to know the law. They are to know how to carry themselves as a queen with people and also how to carry themselves as a queen with the king because there's a specific procedure. Uh, we, we can see this even in modern day monarchy in, in England. You see that with the queen. There is a procedure, there is a protocol when you are in front of the queen. You are, there's a protocol in front of the royal family. You are to bow down, um, you are to curtsy, you can't have your back to the queen, um, you can't be behind the queen or something like that. They have all these protocols. So same thing back in ancient Persia. There were these protocols that these women had to learn. And again, a lot of these women don't, don't know how to carry themselves as a queen. They're living everyday lifestyle on the farm, you know, taking care of their families, taking care of their gardens. A lot of these young virgins have no idea. I don't know why this, it keeps blinking. Uh, so I don't, I'm, I don't know. But a lot of these women don't know. So they had to have been taught. So hey guy, is this comforter. He is, he, he's, he's like a representation of the Holy Spirit. He's preparing these women to be a bride, to please the king. Um, to not just purify herself, but also to get ready, to understand the, the, the king's laws, to understand how the king operates, to be a perfect bride for the 
king. So, and we're gonna see that Esther has favor with Haggai. Could be because uh, Mordecai is also, uh, you know, a servant in the, in, in the at the king's gates. Maybe they've, you know, run into each other. Maybe they know, but for some reason, Haggai has favor with Esther. And obviously it's, the, it's God's providence as well because that's part of the story. Because the story is going to be Haman trying to annihilate the Jews completely every single one of them uh, because of his hatred for Mordecai, which we'll talk about. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. In Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jea, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who were being captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is, Esther, his uncle's daughter. For she so Hadassah is Esther's Jewish name. Esther was her Persian name. And as we see Mordecai, son of Jeher, the son of Shimei, who um, David eventually, King David eventually killed, spared his life for a long time and killed him at the end of his life, which allowed the son of Kitch, a Benjaminite, to um, you know eventually lead to Mordecai, which which we talked about is going to um, finish this ancient feud and fulfill God's prophecy in Exodus seventeen sixteen, where the Lord said, "I'm going to annihilate the Amalekites because of their wickedness and their hatred for Israel." And also, it says in Genesis. Uh, and it says that in, um, I think it was in Ezekiel, where God, where anyone that curses Israel will be cursed, Balaam, prophet Balaam, anyone who, who curses Israel will be cursed, and whoever blesses Israel will be blessed. So we're going to talk more about that, but this is their background. She had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan, the citadel, under the custody of Hegai, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace, into the care of Hegai, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor. So he readily gave beauty preparations to her, besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. So th the favor, the favor that Esther's getting, she uh, has been given seven handmaidens. She's been given the best place, you know, in 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 uh, in the palace for the women. Uh, favor over Esther, whether it be that Haggai, you know, there was there was favor for for Esther, for who knows for what reason. I mean, obviously it's the Lord that that does things like that. But it could be her humility, it could be her beauty, it, it could just be absolutely spiritual that the Father, that God put a special favor on Haggai's heart to nurture her, to give her the best um, chance of winning because he saw something in her that would make her a wonderful queen. Because he's, he's seen a lot of women and he's, you know, seen Vashti and her legalism. And so, um, yeah, he knows what the king needs. Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day, Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Each young woman... So Mordecai would sit at the king's gate. That's where he always propped himself. He was always at, sitting at the king's gate, smiling, and um, that's just where he was every single day. And obviously, with Esther being not far away, he was there to see if he heard anything, uh, how she's doing, and he's just so anxious and probably so excited that... You know, here's a chance of being with, with, with the future queen. But again, it, it breaks Jewish law, the laws of the Torah, where you're not supposed to marry a Gentile and uh, 
you know, you're supposed to be separate. You're not supposed to assimilate. You're supposed to have your own Jewish traditions. And, you know, you live in this land in peace, but you are separate. You don't intermarry. So I wonder what was going through his mind, but it's interesting. His turn came to go in to King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months preparation. 12 months preparation, one whole year. One year, which is customary. Uh, it was customary even in ancient uh, Galilee. It was customary that you'd be engaged and betrothed for a year, preparing yourself for a year before your, your wedding day, before you know you meet your bridegroom. So same thing in ancient Persia. It is a year wait of being um, cleansed, of being purified with oils, preparation with learning laws, etiquette, all that kind of stuff. According to the regulation for the women, for thus were the days of their preparation apportioned. Six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Imagine that. Six months with oils, six months with perfumes. Man. Um, you know, it might seem, and I'm sure it was awesome on the, on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's like every day, you know, for six months each, these oils and perfumes, I mean... Sure, they were lathered and pampered, but uh, I don't know. I don't know if I could take a year of that. <laughs> Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, to the custody of Sheashkaz the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go to the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. So one by one, these young virgins are sent to the king's quarters to be picked out, see which one he likes the best. And um, if he, they can only come, obviously, if he calls for them. And if he calls for them again, they would come. So it's some beauty contest, imagine beauty conscious of like who's 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 the best in bed like let's it's ugh, pagans now when the turn came for esther the daughter of abihail the uncle of mordecai who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king she requested nothing but what he guy the king's eunuch the custodian of the women advised see how humble she is so every woman every young virgin was was allowed to ask for anything she wants what kind of dress what kind of you know shoes what kind of jewelry what kind of you know the women were allowed to choose what they wanted they they can demand you know for a hair piece that they want or gold and silver whatever they want they can ask and they would it would be given to them whereas esther said she didn't demand anything she just said hey guy you know you know the king best why don't you pick something for me? Whatever you pick, I'll wear. How humble. Here is your opportunity to ask for diamonds and gold and you know, all this stuff. You can imagine, she probably walked in so beautiful, but so simple. These women probably had ginormous headpieces and gold and everything, gold necklaces. And here's Esther, probably so beautiful, doesn't even need all of that stuff to show her and resonate her beauty, came in humbly um, and, you know, Haggai again favored her because of her humility, her meekness, her trust in Haggai that he is the Lord, the Lord, he's representation of the Lord, the king, um, his right hand man. So if anyone's going to know how she should dress, it would be Haggai. So why not ask the guy who knows him well, the king well, and, and figure out what to wear. That is called wisdom. Wisdom. When you ask some when you ask advice from people who are way smarter than you, or people that have way more experience than you, or are experts in a certain um, niche, that's wisdom. To not be stubborn and ask someone, hey, what do you recommend? Because you know the king really well. That's called humility and called wisdom. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. And again, more favor because they're like, wow, she is so meek. She's so humble. She's she's so smart. She's asking Haggai what she should wear. Favor. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace 
in the tenth month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So the king obviously was enamored with her beauty and there was favor on her as well from the king and he instantly took the crown um, and crowned her. From what research I've done, normally that's not done that way. The king would go and speak to his chamberlain and would you know, not asking for advice, but there would be a protocol of about, you usually wait a week or something like that. But the king didn't care about the protocol. He took the crown and put it on Vashti's head and, you know, had a ceremony and crowned her queen that day. That's unbelievable. And that is such favor. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther for all his officials and servants. And he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. Big feast, big feast. When virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. In those days... It's this, you know... There's, there's a reason why Mordecai obviously told Esther to keep her identity secret. It turned out that it was the plan of God for them not to say anything, that it worked out um, because of God using her. But it's, it's also interesting that she was hiding it even when she was queen. Um, again, the Jews weren't hated at the time, but you know they were considered slaves uh, because of their exile out of out of Israel and into Babylonia. So even though they weren't living as slaves in Persia, they were free people. They were free to leave. Um, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah went back to Israel. Uh, there was only like a few thousand people that left. Many of the Jews, even though it, they were allowed to go back to Israel, they decided to stay in Persia. It was comfortable for them. They didn't want to carry, you know, the horses or, or their cows or their cattle. They they were comfortable where they are and they decided to stay. Um, and God didn't sp sp explicitly say, all right, guys, time to come back through a prophet. Instead, God assumed that people would go back because that was his promise, that they were going to be return to Israel after 70 years in Babylonian Exile. So again, this, the, the Persians took over Babylonia. They are free to leave, and a lot of a lot of Israelites did not leave. They stayed in Persia, and this is another example where we're going to see of of God's God's will, God's advice is always the best advice. If He is letting you know, hey, go back to Israel. That's where you're supposed to be. It's better to go back there. Listen to the Lord's will. He's doing it to protect you because this situation happened with the, again, these Israelites that did not go back to their promised land, stayed in Persia. This situation is going, it come, arises where they are close to being annihilated, every single one of them. So it's always good to listen to God. He has a, he knows what's going on. He, he knows the future. So, uh, you know, he's trying to protect you. While Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Big Than and Tiresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows. It was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Okay, so gallows were a big long stake and that is where people were hanged. Um, where we see, yeah, you, we see here that it was God's providence as well for Mordecai to overhear two guards who were planning to assassinate the king. And Mordecai told Esther, Esther told the king, and the king had it, you know, 
did an investigation, found out these two were going to kill him. They were killed treason and for treason. And um, he must have, the king must have forgotten that it was Mordecai. Maybe he didn't know that it was Mordecai who said this because there was no, uh, there was really no thank you to Mordecai at this time. There was no, uh, you know, public thank you or he saved my life or any, um, any, um, you know, any favor on Mordecai. It was just Mordecai told Esther and this, it was, you know, the king was saved. But it actually, what's cool about the situation is that the king got to see, wow, I can trust my queen. She has my back. She legitimately has my back. Okay, going to, to Esther 3. This book has 10 chapters. They're pretty quick. I know we're, we're stopping along the way, so it's a little, uh, a little more time, but I, I hope, are you, are you guys enjoying this? Going through it little by little and piece by piece. There's, there's so much to unravel, guys. There's so, there's something that I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about after we get through this chapter, which it was a revelation the Lord gave me a few months ago as I was reading this book. Such revelation brought me to tears about this story. So stay tuned. Man, it's so good. And and obviously we're here because we love to study and read the word. And even if we don't know the Lord, it's cool to let's hear what he's done in the past, which by the way, any atheists watching our agnostics, there's history, there's archeological evidence for Esther. Um, Greek, uh, what was his name? Histories of Her Herodotus, Herodotus. He was a contemporary Greek historian who wrote about Queen Esther. There are stone tablets from Persia. The, you know, the Persian time where they talked about Queen Esther. Unfortunately, you know, modern day times, per, modern day Persia is Iran, and they hide the fact that their one, be, the once beloved queen was a Jewess. She was a Jew. They hide that. They try to erase her out of history, but there's so much architectural evidence. There is so much historical evidence, so much written down, you know, evidence that Queen Esther was in fact a Jewish queen in Persia and was beloved for what happens next. Next chapter. Chapter three. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the Agagite, and advanced him, and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. So this is Haman's exaltation. So Haman was promoted. There was favor in, uh, on Haman's life as well with the king. And he promoted Haman, who again is the Agagite, going back to King Agag. The, again, the Agagites, the Amalekites, well, uh, were nef nefarious enemies of the Jews. And uh, yeah, let's keep going. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not. So <laughs> all the king's servants were within the king's gates bowed and paid homage to Haman. Essentially, almost like he's royalty, like a monarch, because in a monarch you bow and you pay homage. Um, and the king had commanded, uh, for, the, for so the king had commanded concerning him. So uh, the king wanted people to honor Haman because he's been elevated. The king wants you to honor him, not as a royal, but to out of respect because he's being put in such a high position for people to honor him bow or pay homage but Mordecai would not bow or pay homage uh, Mordecai refused to worship this man um, Mordecai probably knew this is what I'm guessing he Mordecai is either very stubborn or he was very well aware of the fact that Haman was an Amalekite which is an ancient, well, it's ancient for us now, at that time was um, an arch nemesis, was an enemy of the Jewish people that the, the God promised Moses, Exodus 17, 16, that he was going to annihilate the Amalekites. So he's either, Mordecai's either very stubborn and he doesn't honor anybody except God, 
and his family, or he knew who Haman was, who his lineage was, and that God was not happy with the Amalekites and that King Saul was supposed to annihilate every one of them, but they're still left here. Um, he was not going to bow down and worship someone that God cursed and uh, doesn't accept. So. Then the king's servants, who were within the king's gate, said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Yeah, because again, transgressing king's command, it's worthy of death. You know, you, you don't, you don't, you listen to the king when he tells you what to do. Um, with Vashti, the king exiled Vashti, you know, with, with Vashti, the king exiled her. Um, he forced her never to look at, look at him again. But in, in this case, you know, you're, you're asking either to be exiled or to be killed. Um, it's, it's a, it's an offense. You listen to what the king tells you. Everyone was on tippy toes around the king not to make a mistake because in that day, off with your head was, uh, quite, or, or being hanged on the gallows was common. Mordecai is either really stubborn <laughs> or he is confident because he knows God's promises. He knows that, um, the Amalekites will be annihilated. And he was probably confident, oh, God has, God has me protected. And I'm not going to bow down to someone who is our enemy. Because cursed are those who curse Israel. That's what the father said. Now it happened when they spoke to him daily and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that... When Haman was told that Mordecai is a Jew, <laughs> his enemy, you know, what? Uh, he was probably livid, which he was. He was livid. Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage. Haman was filled with wrath. And let's talk about this for a second. You know, Mordecai refused to bow down. Mordecai only got on his knees to worship God. And it kind of speaks to the time we're living in now. Do we bow down and cower to pressure of worshiping men? Or are we going to worship God? Like for me, I don't bow down to anybody. I bow down to Father God and His Son and His Holy Spirit. I don't bow down to people. Um, I'll respect people, but if you demand me to worship your idols or demand me to worship you as a human being, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not going to do that. And so it's such a, it's, it's such a time as this uh, where we're seeing Mordecai not bow down. Not bow down. So, interesting. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. So... Mor Haman found out that Mordecai is a Jew and that he was not, first of all, Haman is so prideful. He wants to be honored and he wants to be exalted. And it must have been a thorn in his side that Mordecai, who happens to be a Jew, who he hates, um, is not bowing down to him and not worshiping him and not honoring him. He would, Haman was so mad that he plotted to annihilate not just Mordecai, but all of the Jews there. Again, bringing back to mind this ancient feud that they had, this hatred, this vitriol between the Amalekites and the Israelites. So it's interesting as well because Satan throughout history has used people to come after the Jewish people. He did that with Hitler. He did that with Herod to come against the coming Messiah. Uh, he did that with Moses, with the Pharaoh, was trying to annihilate the Jew, well, using them as slaves and wanted to annihilate them when they left. We see this with Haman, wanting to annihilate the Jews. Here's what it comes down to. And for any non-believer out there who's like, well, why is there such vitriol with Israel? Because God chose Israel to bring the savior of the world, to rescue his people out of the pits of hell a suffering servant that was to come, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. Uh, the suffering servant who was going to be pierced in his hands and his feet 
and be laughed at and despised, betrayed, but is going to save the world and his kingdom and his glory, his dominion will never end for all eternity. Satan knows that, which is why <laughs> Satan knows as well, Ezekiel 12, 10. Ezekiel 12, 10 says that there will come a day where Israel, modern day Israel today, the Jewish community today will realize that they actually pierced and killed their anointed one, Jesus, 2,000 years ago. They're going to realize it and they're going to mourn as if they mourn their firstborn child. So in the other scriptures, it says as well in Revelation, Revelation, I think it's 12, 12, that um, the Messiah will return, Jesus will return, Yeshua, Hamashiach will return to this world with judgment on not just wicked people, but on Satan. He will return right after the Bible, the gospel comes full circle because it came out of the Jewish people into the Gentile nations, Gentile world, back into Israel. And Ezekiel 12, 10, when, when the Jewish people will realize that Jesus fulfilled every single prophecy, the only ones that are left is when he returns because there's two entrances of the Messiah, one on a humble donkey and one on the clouds with his mighty angels in glory on a horse, not on a donkey. Donkey shows peace, meekness. King comes on a horse. And when he's gonna return, he's gonna come as a mighty king with judgment. Satan knows his time is short. So Satan, in order to avoid his judgment, he has been trying to annihilate the Jews throughout history. Again, with Moses, with the Pharaoh, with Herod trying to come after the Messiah Jesus, with um, Haman trying to annihilate all of the Jews, Hitler trying to annihilate all the Jews as well. This is a demonic spirit. Anti-Semitism is a demonic spirit. This is Satan trying to stop the gospel, and, and not even just the gospel, but the word of God from coming true. But we know that God is great and he keeps his promises. He's faithful. <laughs> he is so faithful. And we're going to, we see this in the story as well. Haman trying to annihilate all the Jews. But again, it says, um, you know, blessed are those who bless Israel and cursed are those who cursed Israel, curse Israel. So we see that happening here as well. Who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is, the lot. Lot, Pur, Pur in Persian uh, meant dice. So when you think of lots, you think of dice. So in the first month, um, in order to, again, so Haman, so Haman wants to annihilate all of the Jews. And uh, he's now casting lots to see what day are they going to annihilate the Jews. They probably, I, I don't know what kind of dice they had back in the day. It could be up to number six. It could be up to, you know, 12 or whatnot. Uh, They're probably throwing a bunch of dice at the same time to figure out the day. And it turns out to be, um, you'll see. Before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the 12th month, which is the month of Ada. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples, and they do not. So here is Haman coming to the king and saying, Here's what we gotta do. <laughs> we gotta annihilate these Jews because they don't follow the same laws we do. They're, they're useless, just let's get rid of them. To keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamidatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money and the people are given to you. 
to do with them as seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month, and a decree was written according to all that Haman commanded, to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all people, to every province according to its script. So, the king has favor with Haman. Well, I should say, Haman has favor with the king, and the king didn't do his research. He didn't he didn't, probably didn't know that Mordecai was a Jew either. Uh, well, he probably didn't really even know Mordecai because Mordecai was at the gates. Um, and he probably didn't even know that Mordecai saved his life before and that he was a Jew. And he didn't do his research and the king said, okay, sure, let's go. You can kill, annihilate the Jews. If that's what you recommend, I trust you. You are like the prime minister here. Okay, I trust you. Let's kill them. And sent out a decree to all the different provinces, 127 provinces, to that there's going to be a day where they will annihilate all of the Jews. And it's not even this so here's here's what's here's what's interesting about a king's decree. In ancient times, when a king made a decree, it was a law. It was not obviously a law, but it that law was even higher than the king. Because whatever the king decrees in an edict, it is done. It is in in written in stone. The king cannot go back on it. Once the king makes a decree, you cannot go back on it. It's even similar, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a little bit, the similarity between the king, you know, being a representation of God the Father. If there's one thing that is higher than God the Father in his own eyes, and this is in my opinion, is his law. The Father does, the God does not go back on his law righteousness and and goodness and justice his 10 commandments god never goes back on it um you know he holds it even higher than his own name his laws he can't change those are the, he's he, he encompasses love so it, it it those are the laws that come with his his character and you know um he can't go back and say, oh, actually, this sin is okay, this one's not. No, those are his laws, and he, he can't change them. Just like, for example, this king, King Hasearis, can't go back in his decree, which we'll see, realizes it was a big mistake. Big mistake. And to every people in their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. So every king even especially in the ancient time, they had a, a, a special ring and it had a special design on it. And they would use this, you know, liquid, whatever formula it is, to put the ring in, which was a seal. It was the king's seal on his ring, showing that it was a decree from the king. Um, and, uh, you know, he gave it, he ended up, he gave this ring to Haman to use and trusted him with his king's seal, which shows its authenticity to all of the provinces that it is in fact the king's decree and this is now law. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Ada, and to plunder their possessions. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. Yeah, they were probably so perplexed wondering what is going on. Why are we being and why are we going to be annihilated on the 13th day? Um, like what is going on? This doesn't make any sense. Uh, yeah, see it's lagging. I'm trying to open up my comments here. So again, first of all, and this is actually the reason why one of the reasons why Friday the 13th is a superstitious thing is because of this wicked day that was supposed to happen. The, 13th day was the number that the per that the lots casted which was going to be the day of annihilation of the jewish people okay let's jump into esther 4 how are you guys enjoying this how are you guys what do you guys think 
Are you guys enjoying this? Do you want me to keep reading? Do you, is it a, how's the app? You guys, I actually like the app that it's talking instead of me. But okay, let's continue. Um, okay, next one. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. Sorry, guys, someone's trying to call me. Why are you calling me? You know I'm doing a live thing. Okay, let me go back. In every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Okay, so this was an ancient tradition as well. When Israelites are displeased and want to pray to God and, and uh, you know, we see this all over the Old Testament. The Israelites would put on sackcloth and ashes all over their hair and all over their face in mourning and would pray, fast and pray to God to be heard. They humble themselves as much as they can. Again, putting on a sackcloth, you know, used to carry grain and whatnot um, and putting ashes on their face, being dirty in front of the in front of God the Father, my hair's a mess, and, and, and asking for, and you know, begging for his, his help um, humbly. And, uh, you know, Mordecai comes to the gate of the king, the king's gate, humbly, right? But he comes in sackcloth, which, was, which wasn't allowed. You weren't allowed to go to the king's gate or the king's palace in sackcloth. It's just, it dishonors the king. So uh, Esther, this is why Esther asks one of the guards to go out there and give him uh, clothes, give him a new garment, because he wasn't allowed to be there in sackcloth, but Mordecai didn't care. Mordecai was mourning all the Jews in the entire region and entire empire probably went back to Israel as well. The Jews are going to be annihilated by the Persians. The Persians, this is not good. We, this... There was mourning all over, all over the world. So Mordecai didn't care. He went out there to mourn in front of the king's gate. Like, what did you do? Like, why are you doing this? Why are you annihilating us? I wonder if Mordecai figured out that it was, you know, Haman, obviously, and it was because of Mordecai that this was being done. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him. So again, Esther sent garments to Mordecai because you're not allowed to be at the king's gate with wearing sackcloth. But he would not accept them. But he, he refused. And Esther was like, whoa, what's going on here? Something's really wrong. And she asks, what's going on? Then Esther called Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her. And she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So he she knew something was really seriously wrong for Mordecai to be doing this, obviously. Athak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him. And the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the oh. Jews. That's right. Mordecai knew all the details, what Haman was doing, how much he was paying. That's right. Um, and, you know, gave Esther a copy of the decree as well for her to see with her own eyes what Haman planned. And what are they going to do now? Because now it's a law. It's a decree. There's no way the king himself can't even go back on his own law. So he gave them a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So, so Mordecai is begging Esther, you need to go to the king and speak to him. You need to turn this around. We need you. We have no choice here. You, you have to ask the king for help. So Hathak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hathak 
and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these thirty days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. Okay. I, I might read from here because it, 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 he's talking kind of slow and I don't want to, I know people probably have plans and stuff. Um, so, amen. So Esther is scared and she tells Mordecai, um, I'm not supposed to go into the king's court because the king right now hasn't called me in over 30 days and I, it's against the, it was against the law to go into the king's court, which the king was mostly in the court, um, hearing you know problems or issues. The king, uh, king, uh, um, king Xerxes or King Ahasuerus, there were he was involved in a lot of little wars all over the place in the empire. Again, his his empire was expanding, and so there was always little wars going on. He was always with his uh, army leaders and you know figuring out what to do and constantly. He was busy all the time, and he was in the court, which is why he hasn't called Esther in 30 days. There were probably something going on that he was dealing with. And so it was against the law for Esther to walk into the king's gate, uh, walk into the king's court, unless she was summoned. Not just Queen Esther, but any person was not allowed to walk into the king's court unless he called them in, unless they were part of the meeting. Uh, it was instant death immediate death it was a law that you cannot walk into the king's court unless you are summoned by the king it is instant death unless unless the king has grace and mercy on your life if he extends a golden scepter to the person that walked in it will um it you 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 won't be killed right it's his mercy that okay Here's the golden scepter, and uh, you know he, you don't get killed. So, this is interesting, and there's a reason why there's a photo above of the Lord with a golden scepter on a throne. Um, again, walking into the king's court without being summoned. When you walk in boldly into the king's court without being summoned, it's worthy of death. Again, lawlessness is death. And that's why it says also in the Bible, the wages of sin is death. Lawlessness is another name for sin in the Bible. So the wages of sin is death. The wages of lawlessness is death. If you walk into the king's court without having permission to be there, that's instant death. Unless, unless the king has grace on you and mercy on you and extends to you a golden scepter, even though you don't deserve it, you don't deserve to be there, you don't deserve to walk in boldly into the king's court. The Lord gives grace. And that's why we read in the New Testament, when you are born again, when you are saved, you can walk in boldly to the king's throne. This, is, this, this, this whole book and a lot of the Old Testament, you know, Joseph with his 12 brothers and being betrayed by his brothers, it all points, the Old Testament all points to Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. It all points to him. It all points to the Father. It all points to the Holy Spirit. It all points to Jesus. It all points to him. This, so when I saw this, so this was the revelation I got a few months ago. I saw this picture when I was reading Esther and I was like, wow, it's such a beautiful photo. I made it my background on my you know, laptop and all of that. And um, I was on the phone with a friend and we were just talking about the book of Esther and it hit me. Like it was the Lord's revelation of this is how Jesus is with us. This is how God is with us. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He sits on his throne. We don't deserve to come up to him. We're, we have lived a lawless life um, before we knew God. We were wicked in the world and we don't deserve his grace and his mercy. We're unworthy to walk into his court unannounced. We're not worthy. But Jesus, God, extends his golden scepter and says that's okay i don't judge you that you're law like it's okay i forgive you i have mercy on you you don't deserve to be here but i 
love you. Here is the golden scepter. Because your fa the, the favor of his bride, his beautiful bride walking in, humbly, meek, right? Which we're going to see that, um, that Esther is going to walk in after fasting and praying, being completely meek, walking in. Guys, am, am I going too slow here? Do you want me to speed it up? Or uh, I know we're going in like an hour 20 now. Uh, but it's it's a long book, but I think it's worthy to sit down and go through the entire book in one sitting because it's such a beautiful book. Uh, unless you want to split it in half. Should we split it in half? Let me know. But I think maybe we should just do one entire sitting. Although, let me open up Twitter really quickly. Let me open up my Periscope. Do you guys want me to split this up or should we finish it up in one sitting? Again, we are live. So apologize if the stream is going to lag in a second. <laughs> What do y'all want to do? Let me look at your comments. Let me open you up. It's going to be a little bit slow. I had to. I need to get an iPad. I think I need to get an iPad so I can see your comments on the iPad at the same time. Just keep going. Okay, you guys are good. Okay, keep going. Amen. Are you guys enjoying this? This is so good. I mean, it was so. God is so good. He's so awesome. You are doing fine. Okay, awesome. Praise God. Cool. Praise God. We're gonna keep going. Let's let's. It's we. It's better to do it in one sitting. Amen. Oh, cool. Praise God. All right. Let me. Uh, let. Okay. Let me close this because it's gonna lag. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So. God, I love the story so much. It's my favorite. <sighs> it just shows. God's grace on us, man. The mercy of God, the heart of God, just so beautiful. And when I saw this picture and the Holy Spirit just revealed it, that this is the Lord. This is the picture of the Lord. King Xerxes, this is like a picture. King Ahasuerus, or whatever his name is in Persian. Um, this is the mercy of God, the favor of his bride. The favor, guys, the favor we have, how awesome our God is. It brought me to tears. I was straight up like, Wah. I was on the phone like, oh my God, like this revelation, like praise God. This is the Lord. This is how good he is to us. Anyway, let's continue. Uh, let us continue. And Mordecai told him to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Mm. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Wow. So Mordecai tells Esther, when Esther's like, I can't go in, I'm going to get killed. I'm not, I'm not summoned in, I'm going to get killed. Mordecai tells her, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the kingdom's palace any more than all of the other Jews. You're a Jew. You're a secret Jew, Esther. You're, you're the queen. But Esther, you won't survive this. What makes you think you're going to survive? The king's decree is the king's decree. Someone's going to find out that you're, the, you're a Jew and you're going to be killed. You and your whole house, your father's bakilenia in Russian, your generation will be killed. Um, you know, Queen Esther thinks the most secure place for her is in the palace with the king. She'll be fine. She'll be safe. We see here that, and this is with all of us as well, sometimes we, we feel so secure where we are, especially when we're, you know, not born again and in the world. We feel secure. You know, I felt secure and unstoppable. As kids, you do crazy, risky things because you're, gonna, you're thinking, ah... I can jump out of a plane, nothing will happen to me, I'll, you know. We do the wildest things. I've done the wildest things when I was a kid, thinking that we were invincible, <laughs> that I was invincible, that nothing was gonna happen uh, until reality hits you in the face and you break your arm or your leg. Um, and this is the false security that we have. Esther had a false security as being queen. She thought she'll be okay. No one knows I'm a Jew. Uh, I can't do anything. I don't know what to do. I'm not gonna walk in there and risk my life. And Mordecai is saying, first of all, <laughs> uh, you know, you might not escape this, Esther. Don't think you're going to escape this. And number two, what makes you think that you won't be removed and someone else will come to save 
the Jews because Mordecai knows, he knows God's promises and God's faithfulness. God promised Abraham that his seed, again, seed, not seeds, right? Uh, Isaac, not Ishmael, Jacob, not Esau, seed, that this, there's going to be a seed that comes, the anointed one, the Messiah is going to come out of, the, of Abraham and it's going to save the world. And he knows God promised to get rid of the Amalekites. He's the, God promised to get rid of Haman. And so Mordecai is mourning and fasting, but he's also confident that God is going to come and he, he, he keeps his promises. And he's going to be faithful in his promise as well in this situation. And he's telling Esther, if it's not going to be you, it's going to be somebody else. If it's not going to be you, God's going to use somebody else. Because God kept this, God made this promise to the Israelites. He's going to keep it. And again, I want to go back to what I was saying before. The most secure place is not within walls of a palace. The most secure place is in the will of God. Queen Esther thought she was safe in her palace and nothing's going to happen to her. Well, no, the most secure place is in God's will, is under God's wings. That's where you're mostly secure. That's it, that's what it comes down to. And so this false sense of security, um, Esther 414, man, my favorite verse, and I know every, it's like the crux of this whole book. For if you remained completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows, Esther, whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. There is a time to be silent and there is a time to rise up. There is a time for peace and there's a time for war. There's a time to uh, be quiet and there's a time to be bold. This is the time for Esther to be bold, to stand up for her people. She is married to the king of the entire empire. This is her time to come out as a Jew and come out for her people, stand up for her people, stand up for her whole life. This was the time, such a time as this Esther, if it's not now, when? If it's not now, it's never. You better do it like this. Who knows if the father, if the God put you in this position for such a time as this, for you to stand up for her, for your people. Wow, I must have hit home when those, those are some powerful words, man. Whew. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. And she thought Go. about it. Gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Esther thought about it. She, she, she realized he's right. He's right. She's a queen. This is her husband. She has to take a chance here. She has to stand up for her people. So she said, uh, everyone fast. Jews all over in every providence have word go out fast with me. I'm going to have my women fast with me three days and three nights. This is also known as Esther's fast. Esther's fast, which is not drinking, not eating, nor drinking. Imagine not having water for, for three days. I mean, I, I've tried to do it. It's, it's really tough. I've done like a day and a half, but um, I, I want to try to do three days, even though, you know, it's it, anyway, but you have to do it with the grace of God, obviously, and also uh, be led to do it. But it's a great fast, not eating, not drinking. So she probably, she eventually goes into the king's court, probably all disheveled and exhausted and tired. Uh, actually, I mean, maybe full of energy and full of like anxiety. But um, yeah, she told everyone to fast. And she said, even though it is against the law, I'm gonna walk in boldly. And if I perish, I perish. So she realized Mordecai's right. She. She has no choice. She has to attempt to talk the king out of it. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. So Mordecai went and told the other Jews, we have to fast in agreement. Sorry about the ambulance. I'm in, uh, you know, loud city here. So second, um... 
Corinthians. One second, I'll wait till it passes. Second Corinthians seven. Oh my gosh, I'll wait till it passes. Give me a second. I'm trying to extend this also. Such a time as this, Esther. Such a time as this. Oh my goodness. I'm just gonna keep going. Second Corinthians. Uh, Second Corinthians seven fourteen. God said through Apostle Paul, for if my people shall humble their shall humble themselves, fast and pray. I will hear them from heaven and I will answer them and I will heal their land. So his people are going to gather around fast and pray for three days, no eating, no drinking to get a response from God. They know their Lord is faithful. They have, he's done so many miracles in Egypt. I mean, uh, he, all the prophets were exactly on point with all the prophetic words. You know, Jeremiah warning the Israelites uh, that this repent and they didn't repent and all that stuff. And, and, and they've seen that God is faithful. He warns them, but he also saves them. He is their secure fortress. He is their God. He is faithful. So let's go on to the next chapter five. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the... No, I'm, I'm going to read it. It's going to be a little faster. Esther's banquet. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace. So she's to put on her royal robes across from the king's house while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, which was the royal courthouse, by the way, facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. So again, it's against the law to walk in without the king's calling you in. Unless God hands over, oh God, well, it isn't, uh, you know, uh, representation of the Lord. The king has to extend a golden scepter. She has to touch it. And that, that way the guards know you don't have to kill her because she, he extended his golden scepter. And the king said to her, what do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? There might, it must be something because she's walking in unannounced. It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. He has such favor for her. I'll give you, and it was also a sign of like such respect and favor again, when the king um, says, I'll give you up to half your kingdom. Even Herod, during the time of Jesus, uh, you know, told Herodian's daughter, uh, I'll give you up to half the kingdom. This was a sign of honor and respect. So Esther answered, if it pleases the king. Again, she walked in after fasting and praying three days. She said, if I perish, I perish. Okay, he, he, give her, he gave her grace with her life. But now here's her plea. If it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. At the banquet of wine, king said to Esther, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Why did you call me here? What, what's up? I'll, I'll, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. What is your request? Up to half the kingdom. It shall be done. Then Esther answered and said, my petition and request is this. And this is an interesting request, by the way, that she's going to make. Because she could have just right there and then said, Haman is wicked. He's trying to kill us. I'm a Jew. You know, we need to, you need to fix this. She could have did that. And that's what we're all expecting her to say. But instead, she makes an interesting petition. She says, actually... Come back for another day of, come back for another feast, which we're gonna read. Um, and this is an interesting petition because I wonder, you know, what what made her say that? Uh, it was obviously probably, you know, the Holy Spirit guiding her to ask for another day or whether she's in wisdom building up suspense. Uh, it's, I mean, it's already suspenseful that she walked into the king's palace to have a banquet with him and Haman. Like, what's the point of this? Um, there's something that she wants, but in building suspense and allowing the father to do what he's going to do with that extra night, which we're going to see, is quite interesting. So then Esther answered and said, my petition and request is this. 
If I have found favor in the sight of the king and it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet which I prepare for them and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. So she's asking him to return again tomorrow for another banquet with the king and Haman. Okay, verse nine, Haman went out that day joyful and glad in his heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, again, Haman is so joyful. He's so happy. He's going to obliterate the Jews. Like, I mean, there's already a law. Uh, it's happening. Uh, there's nothing they can do about it. He thinks like, that's it. Like, it's going to happen. It's over. So Haman is so joyful, so prideful, so exuberant, so happy. This is his, these are his enemies, like this ancient feud. And he's going to be the one to annihilate them. He's so happy. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. So think about this. Think about this. Mordecai didn't bow down and didn't worship Haman. At, and that's what kicked off this whole thing. And um, here he is again. Mordecai, uh, Haman expecting Mordecai to bow down and plead for an apology and like, and plead for mercy. But Mordecai refused to stand up. He refused. He sat there. He's like, nope. So again, one of two things. <laughs> Mordecai is either extremely stubborn or he knows that uh, these are the enemy of, 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 of his people, obviously, trying to annihilate them, and that God is good and he's gonna hear his prayers and that he's going to save his people. And so it's so interesting. He just refuses to get up. And Haman obviously is so pissed. He's like, are you kidding me? Are, you still don't respect me? I'm gonna have your, your whole, all your people annihilated. Oh, you're working, I know. Okay, watch it later. God bless you. <laughs> I have your uh, Periscope comments up now. Okay, I think it's actually, I actually like reading it um, because it can move a little faster. But yeah. did you guys like that app? Do you want me to go back to the app or do you want me to keep reading? I'm reading your comments. Okay. So Haman went out joyful. Uh, Mordecai at the king's gate did not stand or tremble before him. He was filled with indignation against Mordecai. So Haman is pissed again. Keep reading. Amen. Okay. So Mordecai, uh, Haman is like livid. He's, are you kidding? He's still not getting any respect from this man. So nevertheless, Haman restrained himself. He didn't say anything to, to Mordecai. He restrained himself and went home to basically, you know, gossip and pour out. Uh, okay. You like both. Amen. I'll do a mix of both here and there. Cool. Perfect. So. Then Haman told, uh, blah, blah. so Haman restrained himself, went home and sent and called his friends. He called his friends and his wife, Zeresh, to get it all off his chest. So he didn't just, you know, come and talk to his wife. He's like, gather my friends. I got to tell you about this stubborn Jew over here who is not listening, who is, uh, which is also funny actually, because it's an exodus. I forgot what chapter. Um, where God said, this was his words to Moses. He said, I didn't pick uh, the Jewish people because they were great in numbers. I didn't pick the Israelites because they're great in numbers. Actually, they are the least of all nations. But I, and I didn't pick them uh, because of their stiff neck, stiff necked. So he's saying that the Israelites are stiff necked. The Jewish people are stiff necked. Listen, I can say that because I'm half Jewish. My dad is Jewish. So um, I'm a little stubborn. It's true. Although the Lord has been fixing that in me, um, but I'm a new creation. But, um, you know, but, but God said to Moses, I'm not picking you because you're stiff necked and stubborn. I'm picking you because I love you. So um, Mordecai is stiff necked as well. He's stubborn as well. So we see that here. So Haman told, uh, so he invited his friends and his wife then Haman told them of his rich, of his great riches, the multitude of his children, everything in which the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced in him above the officials and the servants of the king. He was bragging. He was bragging. I'm like, the king elevated me, and all this greatness was happening. I'm being honored, and everything's so awesome. And But he 
ends up telling them about the thorn in his side. Thorn in his side. About Mordecai. Um, and it's like, why would you even... I don't know. If, if suffering everything is so awesome, who cares about this one person that's being annoying, right? Don't, don't let the enemy distract you. But he is so angry and he can't let it go. So moreover, Haman said, besides, besides, Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared. And tomorrow I am again invited by her along with the king. You know, I'm, I'm being honored. The queen is having a banquet for me and the king. Like, this is so amazing. Yet, all this avails me nothing. Meaning this, I don't even care that the queen is inviting me and the king and is honoring me in an awesome private banquet. Because so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. So he's saying, all this is great, but it's really not. It's nothing to me because I'm so tired of this Mordecai the Jew. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, let a gallows be made, 50 cubits high. And in the morning, suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it, in the morning. Then go merrily with the king to the banquet. Let's break this down right now, because this is interesting. Zeresh and his friends say, let a gallows be made 50 cubits high. How high is 50 cubits? Anyone know? How high is their suggestion to make a gallow? Which, by the way, they're telling him, go in the morning to the king. And then Mordecai, Mordecai be hanged tomorrow on it. Even though there's already a decree that all the Jews are going to be annihilated. They're so conceited and saying, go to the king tomorrow, he'll kill him. He's, there's already a law. Leave the king alone. Like, what are you doing? Number two, how high is 50 cubits? Who knows how high 50 cubits is? So one cubit, it's very tall. Yeah, it's super tall. Wait till you find out how tall this is. One cubit is about 25 inches. 25 inches. So we have 50 cubits times that by 25. Someone do the math and tell me. But then divide that by 12 inches in one foot. It's 104 feet high. 104 feet high. His friends are saying, make 104 feet high gallows so the whole providence can see Mordecai hanging off this gallow. Well, in some studies, it's saying 75 feet. In other studies, it's 104 feet. So it depends how much a cubit is, but yeah. Um, so it's, it's about 104 feet. I've, I've done the math. Uh, but yeah, d double check. But there's, again, there's different sources saying 75 feet. Some sources saying 105 feet. Either way, it doesn't even matter. 75 feet is really high anyway. Let's, let's just, let's go with the little number. 75 feet, okay? 75 feet high gallow. Imagine, that is so high. Okay. Insane. So, and it pleased Haman. So the gallows were made. So he made a 105 foot gallow for, for uh, Mordecai to be hung on or hanged on, not hung. Six. <laughs> the point is it's high. Thank you. Sorry. I'm taking too long on it. Okay. The king, so that night, this is what's interesting, the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. So that night, the king could not sleep all night. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. This is called um, the, um, the, Persian, the, the book of the Persian kings. There was this, you know, historical record of everything that was going on. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of uh, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King uh, 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 Ahasuerus. Then the king said, what honor or dignity was bestowed on Mordecai for this? So again, king couldn't sleep, which is God's sovereignty of, you know, you know the Jews were sleeping and, and were stressed out and mourning, but they didn't know what was going to happen. But Father God was not sleeping. And it says the God never slumbers nor sleeps. He never slumbers nor sleeps. So he's always devising a plan for us. God is working behind the scenes, even though we don't see him, even if we're sleeping, he is always working for our good. 
So, the king couldn't sleep, asked to read the ancient scrolls, and here, here, here he's finding out, wait, Mordecai? Saved my life? He was the one that saved my life? Okay, did we honor him? The king's servants attended, said, nothing has been done for him. So the king said, who is in the court? And now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest. So Haman, Haman first thing in the morning, Haman's there to ask the king to hang Mordecai on his gallow that he just made him. And Haman entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that he hang Mordecai. The king's servant said to him, Haman is there standing at the court. King said, let him come in. Haman came in and the king asked him, before Haman even asked to, Mor to hang Mordecai, this is the awesome reversal, this ironic reversal that we see. The king asked him, what should be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Haman thought in his heart, oh, he's probably talking about me. Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? He's probably thinking, you know, he's thinking in his heart. And Haman answered the king, he said, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought, which the king, ha which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head, which is like the king's, the king's horse. Then let his robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, and that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback throughout the entire city square and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. So again, you know, Haman's standing there thinking, wow, he's there. Esther has a private banquet for me and the king. The king is asking how his, his wonderful, you know, servant should be honored. Uh, he's thinking, wow, I'm about to get this is amazing. Like this, you should honor him as a king. <laughs> um, you should honor him throughout the entire square. So this must have been the biggest shock of Haman's life right before the banquet, the second banquet. The king said to Haman, hurry then, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested, as you have suggested, and do this for, Mal for Mordecai the Jew, who sits within the king's gates. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken probably like he Haman probably had to lift his jaw off the floor like what <laughs> what I'm gonna be honoring Mordecai what is going on after <laughs> so so Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed Mordecai probably rolling his eyes the entire time and he he had to honor what he promised the king he would do so he had to do it and it was Haman who had to do this, not anyone else, which is the funny, ironic reversal that we see here. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, thus shall it be done. You know, he's, he's holding his horse as they're walking. Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Imagine like Mordecai sitting on the horse, like, wow, I'm being honored in all of the square. Like the Lord, God is starting to move. God is starting to move. After Mordecai went back, after, afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate. Back there, you know, mourning and, and all of that. But Haman hurried to his house, mourning. I'm probably in tears, like sweating, like what is going on? Why are we honoring Mordecai? And I can't believe I just had to walk him through the entire city honoring this man that I absolutely hate. Mourning with his head covered. Uh, he, didn't want, he didn't want to talk to anybody. He was just like, let me just get home right now. I'm gonna kill myself at home. So when came, Haman told his wife, how embarrassing, right? When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all of his friends everything that happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him. So Haman told them what just happened. And so his wife and his friends are thinking, wow, what does this mean? The response is interesting. They said to him, if Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. This is an interesting scripture. This is an interesting verse. They said to him, if, if Mordecai 
before whom you have begun to fall is of Jewish descent. You will not prevail against him. There's two possible intentions behind this verse. Number one, obviously, Mordecai is being honored and the Jews are about to get killed and, and the king honors and respects Mordecai. Uh, the Jew, he's, he's going to be, he's going to be heartbroken to, to kill him. And there's another part where this, this is what's interesting about knowing context. Daniel under Babylon, remember where they're at in Shushan, it's separate. It's, it's far away from uh, Babylon, not too far, but Daniel was, uh, you know, a Jewish leader, a Jewish prophet and leader who was exalted in the, in the Babylonian era under Nebuchadnezzar. And he was honored, just like Esther is honored in Persia. God, by the way, can use men and women, obviously, um, to, to, to have his will. I just felt the presence of God. To have his will occur, right? But Daniel was so well known and so well loved in Babylon and honored after he was exalted. Everyone in Babylon knew his prophecies. Everyone knew Daniel's prophecies of the coming Messiah. Um, I want to actually read to you some of the prophecies because these prophecies probably got to Persia as well. It probably got to Persia as well. And this is probably another reason why they said this, because not only if, if Mordecai is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail. That's a pretty strict way to say that, because it's one thing of like, OK, well, that's you're going to lose favor with the king. But they're saying you're not if he's Jewish, you are not going to prevail. Why? Because they probably knew David's prophecies. For example, uh, you know, obviously the prophetic words in, in, in Genesis, right? Uh, uh, that, um, you know, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to, they're never going to be annihilated. They're going to be mighty, uh, mighty family in the whole world. But Daniel's prophecies, Daniel 627 reads, he delivers and rescues God. God delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? Okay, so God rescues and performs signs and wonders. Other one, Daniel 7, 27. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given of the saints of the highest one. So... The sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all of the kingdoms under the whole entire heaven will be given to his people. God will give dominion to his people. So Zeresh and his friends probably knew these prophecies that if Mordecai is of Jewish descent, you are not going to win. You're going to fail, Haman. And this is this verse, this verse is the one prophetic sentence prophetic verse in the whole book there's one prophecy in this whole book and it's that chapter 5 verse 13 this was a prophetic word he's if he's of jewish descent you will not prevail you will lose you will fall you will surely fall before him i'm sure haman was like oh dang it i made a big mistake so verse 14 while they were still talking with him the king's un while they were still prophesying to him and telling him of his coming destruction and fall the king's eunuchs came in and hastened to bring Haman back to the banquet, to the second night of Esther's banquet that she prepared. Esther 7. Amen to everyone hanging in. Like, this is so good. This book is so good. There's, there's a lot here, but so good. 7. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day of the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? Like, why am I here? This is the second night of your feast. Why am I here? What's going on? What do you want? I'll give it to you. It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered him and said, If I found favor in your sight, O king. Here she goes. She's about to tell him. And if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition. She's saying, save my life if it pleases the king save my life and my people at your request for we have been sold 
my people and I to be destroyed, to be killed and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue. She said, if we would have been sold as slaves, I wouldn't have said anything to you, but they're coming after my life. And although the, and although the enemy can never compensate for the king's loss. So imagine the king hearing, what? Who, who's coming to kill you? Who, who's coming to annihilate you? Who, what do you mean your people? Like who, who, who wants to kill my bride, my wife, Queen Esther, who he so greatly loves and favors? Who's doing, who, what? So King, Ahas, uh, King Ahasuer, I like to call him King Xerxes because I, I, I don't like the Persian name. Uh, King, King Xerxes, also Persian. So, so King Xerxes answered and said to Queen Esther, who is he? And where is he? And who dare presume in his heart to do such a wicked thing, to do such a thing? And Esther said, huh, probably a nice pause, because Haman's probably like, who in the world? Haman's sitting there thinking, who in the world, in their right mind, would ever want to kill the queen? Who He's probably thinking, yeah, I want to kill him too. Who is he? Who can presume in his heart to kill the queen? Who in their right mind would, would have that idea? So Haman is probably like, again, on his tippy toes, like, who, who would do this? And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Whoa, probably fell off his chair there. Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Then the king arose in his wrath. This is something that you know, a royal king doesn't really do. He doesn't just like get up and leave the table and go to the garden by himself. The king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. Again, not typical for a king just to rise and leave like that. So he went to go think by himself. What's go what 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 did she just tell me? Haman is trying to kill my queen, my bride, and her people. But Haman stood before Queen Esther. He started pleading for his life. I can just imagine. Pleading for his life, for he saw the evil was determined against him by the king. I mean, the king was full of wrath, walked out, going probably back and forth, back and forth. And he turns to Queen Esther, who was so greatly loved, who was so greatly favored by not just the king, but her, but people in the whole entire kingdom, pleading for his life. And when the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman was so desperate pleading with Queen Esther that he ended up on, his, on her bed. Haman was begging the queen for his life to the point where he was found on the queen's bed, which was such a sign of disrespect. First of all, what? Like, that's a, that you're really dishonoring the queen and the king to be on the queen's bed. But he, he was so desperate, crying and mourning and begging her. And he's, he's so, the king returns and Haman had fallen across the couch. It says couch here, but it was actually her bed. It says in, an, uh, in, 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 in KJV, uh, no, in another version. Um, whether it be a couch or his bed, but I think it was, it was her bed where Esther was. Then the king said, will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? How dare he? Haman, you have the audacity to be laying on the queen's bed or the queen's couch while I'm in this house? Are you out of your damn mind? Like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> it's over, man. It's over. As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face from poverty to the palace, right? And from exactly from palace back to poverty for Haman. So as the word left the king's mouth, the guards instantly covered Haman's face. Now, back in that, during that time, if you had your face covered, it means you're sentenced to death. You're, com you're condemned to death. It's also because this traitor has no more right to look onto the king. Like, so it means two things. One, you are sentenced to death. Number two, you don't have the right or the honor anymore to even look at the king. So his face was covered. Now, uh, Harbona, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, look, 
he told the king what happened. He said, look, the gallows, which are 50 cubits high, 75 feet, 100 feet, however high, it's really high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf. Mordecai, by the way, you know, he's, he's basically saying king. Um, Haman made a gallow, 100 feet high for Mordecai, who, by the way, saved your life. And is standing at his house, at, Haman, at the house of Haman, is standing at his house. The king said, what? He, what? The king said, hang him on it. Hang Haman on his own gallow. Whoa, ultimate reversal. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. So look at this, like, whoa, ironic reversal so powerful and and this is a prayer that i have for this country this is a prayer that i have for this country that the same wicked men and women who hate the american people who hate humanity who hate christians jews whatever around the world i pray that wicked men around the world lord in the name of jesus i pray the wicked men and women that have created gallows for the american people I pray, Lord God, that those wicked men be hung on their own gallows. Let them be hanged, not hung, you hung a coat, I, liter literature class. Ha let them be hanged on their own gallows, Lord. All of the wicked men that have gallows for us, let them be hung and hanged on their own gallows. Wow. So here's what happens next. So again, even though they, they killed Haman, who, who created this whole idea... They still have a big problem because on the 13th day of March, Adar, the 13th day of March, they are going to annihilate all of the Jews. It is a law. They can't, go, the king cannot go back on it. Imagine the king mourning because the king was mourning like, oh my God, I can't believe I did this. Like my wife is, is, is a Jew. Her, her people are, are the Jews and I have a decree to kill all the Jews. What was I thinking? How did Haman get me so blindsided and so blind? What do I do? Um, they have to figure out what to do now. So on that day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the house of Haman. Oh, let me go back a little bit. See. So on that day, the king gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. So, so he gave the, the queen, you can have Haman's house. Like we killed him. You can have his house and all his belongings, his spoils, basically. And Mordecai came before the king for Esther had told him he was related to her. So Mordecai is like, hey, by the way, I'm the queen's cousin, hey. Um, and <laughs> so the king took off his signet ring, his mighty ring, you know, his ring that had his uh, emblem on it that he had given to Haman, which he had taken from Haman and given it and he gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. So Esther appointed, so the, the king gave Esther the house of Haman and Esther gave it to Mordecai. He said, hey, you can have your enemy's stuff. Now Esther spoke again to the king. She fell down at his feet. And so, by the way, look at the difference here. Uh, you know, when, when es the, the two entrances of Esther to the king begging for his help you know on his her first time after she fasted and prayed she went to the king and, and asked him to save uh you know to come to the banquet and here she is now on her down on her feet and uh, down at his feet with tears crying and she said and, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of haman the agagite and the scheme which he had devised against the jewish the, the jews the jewish people and the king held out the golden scepter again toward Esther. So again, she walked in the court without his permission. And he again, uh, with mercy and grace, gave her the scepter. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it pleases the king, and I have found favor in his sight, and the things seem right to the king and I, king, and I am pleasing, pleasing in his sight, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of the son of the Agagites, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come on my people? 
or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? The king said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hands on the Jews. You yourselves, you yourselves go and write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring, no one can revoke. Again, it's the law. Whatever is decreed by the king is automatically law. It's, it's, it's in law, uh, you know, it's, it's officially law when his ring puts a stamp on it, the, the stamp of the king's approval. He said, go and change the law and fix it. I don't know what to do. He's like, you guys do it. So the king's scribes were called at that time. So again, king calls a lot of scribes over because there's 127 provinces, okay? Uh, the 13th day is quickly approaching. They need to do something quickly. They got to get all these messengers out. So that he called a bunch of scribes to write these decrees, to write this new decree. So the king's scribes were called at that time in the third, in the third month, in the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day, <clears throat> and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded. So 23rd day of the month. So they're, you know, about like more than two weeks away from that terrible day. Again, they need to go to all the provinces and it's far. The, the, the provinces, it's a big empire. He's got to reach a lot of land real quick. So it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded. No FedEx at that time, right? You're by on horses. That's it. Horseback. That's it. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, uh, the governors, the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all to every province in its own script, in its own language, right? They all have different dialects in all these different provinces to every people in their own language and to the Jews in their own script and language. So even, you know, uh, at that time, the Jews were mostly speaking, not Hebrew, they're mostly speaking uh, Aramaic. Aramaic is the language that the that the Israelites learned and started using most often after Babylonian captivity, after the Babylonian exile, because the Babylonians were speaking Aramaic, and you can look it up. But um, so they were mostly speaking Aramaic at the time. And actually, when the when the Israelites returned back to Israel, it, it remained to be the primary language. The you know the Leo de, the lingo de, 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 de Franca of of Israel it remained to be Aramaic. And when Jesus came, he also spoke in Aramaic. Again, it's something that they picked up in uh, Babylon. So to all the provinces, all in their own language. Okay, and he wrote in the name of the king, sealed it with the king's ring, and sent letters by uh, horseback riding on royal horses everywhere. So they, they went all over to the provinces. By these letters, the king permitted the Jews who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives. So basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have to read this whole thing. Here's what happens. They made a new decree that every single Jew in every single province can protect their life. So the decrees made on the 13th day of March that um, the Jews will be annihilated. Now there's a new decree. Since we can't, the king cannot negate that law. He, ha he adds on to it. He says, okay, but all the Jews can protect themselves and their families. They can fight back on that day. Jump to verse 15. So Mordecai, look at this. Look, look, look at the difference in what Mordecai is wearing now. Because again, Mordecai is honored, is being honored by, by the king. And look at the change in garment from what Mordecai was wearing sackcloth and look what he's wearing now. So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and were glad. I love this verse because again, you know, um, put that next to how he looked before. Now he's in gold and, and being honored and my favorite verse is this, and the people rejoiced. Proverbs 29, 2. It's one of my favorite Proverbs. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, when a wicked man rules, the people mourn, right? When Haman was ruling a wicked man, people were mourning. But when a righteous man rules, the people rejoice. 
that's that's exactly what we're seeing here mordecai righteous man is now ruling and is in charge and the people are rejoicing everyone's happy and glad proverbs 29 2. so the jews had light and gladness joy and honor and in every province and city wherever the king's command and decree came the jews had joy and gladness a feast and a holiday uh, then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. So many people actually assimilated and became Jews because Jews were so honored and now so, um, you know, uh, so favored in, in Persia by the king and the queen herself is Jewish. Whoa. So a lot of people became Jews. Uh, because they were, they were, uh, they didn't want to, you know, they were scared of the Jews. They wanted to become one of them to, to also be in control and being loved and favored. So yeah, let's go to chapter nine. We're almost done. So now on the 12th, it was actually the 12th month and the day of Adar, but it says, it says in my study that it was March, but it, the Jewish calendar is a bit different than, than just our regular calendar. Now the 12th month is the month of Adar. On the 13th day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed, the day that the Jews were supposed to be annihilated. On that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. So again, this decree came out. The enemies of the Jews, any Amalekites left over, Haman has 10 sons, their families. They're like, okay, anyone that disliked any Jews had the right to go out and kill them. It wouldn't be considered murder. It was a law that if any enemies out there can go and kill the Jews and no, they're not gonna be, you know, held liable or, you know, be in trouble for it. So, so on that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. The opposite occurred, right? Because they were thinking we're, we're, we're outnumbering the Jews. We can easily kill them anyway. Even though the queen is Jewish, we can kill them anyway because we it's the law but we're gonna see is that the king's guards and his officers were afraid of Mordecai because they had such honor and respect for him now he's so honored and favored by the king and he's Jewish so you'll see you know we're, we're gonna see that the king's officers come to the defense of the Jews and they the the enemies of the Jews were overpowered so the opposite occurred the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king to lay hands on those who sought to harm them and no one could withstand them because fear of them because fear of them fell upon the people and all the officials of the provinces the satraps the governors and all those doing the king's work helped the Jews because of the fear of Mordecai fell upon them for Mordecai was great in the king's palace and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai became increasingly prominent and the Jews defeated all of their enemies. Amen. Okay, let's skip forward a little bit. Um, so yeah, so, the king, so we'll jump to verse 12. The king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men. In Shushan. So obviously with everything going on, the king was trying to get word, okay, what's going on in this province? What's happening in this province? What's going on over here? He wanted updates on what was happening. So the king, when he got an update, he came to the queen and told her what was going on. Because again, queen is separate. The king is, uh, the, the queen is um, separated and, and again, secluded and yeah, protected and, and all that. So the king would update Queen Esther. He said, hey, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan and also 10 sons of Haman. God uh, fulfilled his, his promise, Exodus 17, 16, that he was going to get rid of the Amalekites. Prophecy fulfilled and, uh, you know, promise fulfilled. Uh, so the ten sons of Haman were killed. And what have what have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Or, you know, what further request do you have, Queen Esther? Queen Esther said, if it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan to go to, to do again tomorrow according to today's decree and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. So here's what Esther said. She said, it's great. It's great that the Jews were able to fight back and kill 500 of their enemies in Shushan, but let there be an extra decree that tomorrow on the 14th day that we kill any 
enemies of the Jews. Let's turn it back around. Let's come after and let's get rid of anyone that hates the Jews, the enemies of the Jews. And he said, okay. So the plan of Satan <laughs> totally backfired because then they came after his own wicked children. So the king commanded this to be done and the decree was issued in Shushan and they hanged Haman's 10 sons on gallows. So same thing that happened to the father happened to them. And that shut down the Agagite, uh, uh, the, the, the Amalekites generations. It was done there. And the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day and killed 300 men, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, not blah, blah, blah. This is fantastic. They got um, their uh, justice and they killed their enemies. Oh, and here's what's also interesting. Two things. So the Jews were able to kill all their enemies. They refused to take. Yep, the table's turning. The tables are turned, which is what's so awesome. That's what I pray for this country, that there has been so many wicked men and women in power in this country and that are still in power in this country who hate this country who have sold out our country whether it to be communist china you know iran modern day persia who's no longer righteous unfortunately um and i just pray that this turning of the tables happens to the wicked men and women that hate us that hate freedom that hate the americans that hate the world so anyway yeah, so they're able to get rid of their enemies. They did not take their plunder. They didn't take their spoils. And here's what happens. The Feast of Purim happens. So now Satan was trying to annihilate all the Jews and they ended up becoming the victors in the end. And this Feast of Purim happened. So the Feast of Purim is on is honored on the 13th and the 14th day of March. And it's it's a feast in remembrance of that day. So uh, it was a day that Satan wanted to annihilate all of the Jewish people and God with his goodness and his grace and his faithfulness honored and protected and saved his people. Saved his people. So. Feast of Purim. It's a two-day feast where all of the Israelites, all of the Jews celebrate the day, the, the days and the time when God stepped in in his faithfulness to protect them. There's some other notes I wanted to really quickly talk about. Yeah, you see this beautiful symmetry, right? Awesomely beautiful symmetry. You know, it started off this, the whole uh, chapter, the whole book started off with the feasts of the king. It ends with the feasts of uh, Purim. Then you have the exaltation of, Ham uh, of Haman. You have the exaltation of Mordecai. In the middle, you have the two days, the two day feasts of Esther. And in the center, which is what this whole story revolves around, is... Haman wanting to kill Mordecai and the Jews and have, you know, having to uh, honor Haman, uh, honor Mordecai. It was flipped right in the center. There was a few other things I wanted to say. Yeah, God is faithful. When God seems absent and his people are in exile and unfaithful in the Torah, right? Queen Esther, who married the king, she is actually going against the laws of Moses. She wasn't supposed to marry a Gentile. She wasn't supposed to assimilate into that kind of world. She was supposed to be separate. And even though she was beautiful and favored and all of that by God, she was still, um, you know, disobeying God. And, uh, but he was still faithful. He was still faithful, faithful and used her mightily and greatly. And God did not abandon his people, nor his promises, nor his promises. So I want to go back to what we were talking about. Let's wrap this up with this. Look how, look at the two brides, because this is what the story revolves around. The two brides. We have Queen Vashti, who was the queen of, the bride, I should say, of 
legalism, laws. She cared a lot about what people thought about her. She didn't want to go out to the king even though he called her because she didn't want to be embarrassed. She cared about what she looked like. She was the bride of legalism. Put that next to Queen Esther who was humble and meek. And um, even though she was breaking the, you know, her, the, the, the laws of the Torah um, and, you know, sleeping with a Gentile pagan king before she was married and wasn't even supposed to marry, she came with him with, with love. And she, whatever he decreed, whatever she said, she was humble, she didn't argue. She, she was a bride of love. There's a difference between the bride of legalism and the bride of love, which is so interesting to see in this story because, um, you know, that's what the Messiah did when he came. He freed us from the laws of, you know, legalism. It's this now just this bride of love that he so wants, a relationship, not being afraid of looking like a fool, right? Not not caring what people are going to think about you. You just do whatever he says and you do it gladly and with a smile on your face, even though it might not make sense. Even though the will, it doesn't make sense in the moment. It might look ridiculous and it doesn't make any sense, but there's a reason for it. God does it for a certain reason. And we see in the end how good God is and how faithful he is. He promised he would have their back. And even though, um, you know, again, Esther was being unfaithful to God by marrying a pagan Gentile king, he still honored his people. He still kept his promises. He still saved them. That's how awesome it is. And again, I love this picture because this is for me, like, obviously besides, you know, God's providence and how he keeps faith, his faithfulness, this resonates with me because the king on the throne who we can walk boldly, it says in the New Testament, we can walk boldly to the throne of God, boldly, because not what we've done, but because of what Yeshua, the Messiah, the Messiah has done for us, what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Um, you know, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. And he is awesome to forgive us. And awesome in his mercy and his grace to say, your, your filthy rags on, but I love you and, and you, you know, I died for you and long life for you. So amen, hallelujah. What an awesome story. What an awesome, where we've been together for two and a half hours. Awesome. I knew it was going to go long. Um, praise God. Isn't this the most amazing picture? Guys, this picture's on Google. Google it. Uh, Jesus on the um, throne or if, if you can't find it, send me a message in private DM and I will send you this picture. Hallelujah. What a day. What a day. What a story. Wow. What a, such a fascinating book. And I also actually recommend this book. This is another fantastic book. It's called Messiah in the Feasts of Israel by Sam Nadler. Really great insight into all of the feasts. Feasts of Tabernacles, Feasts of Purim, um, the Sabbath, you know, all of the feasts and how all the feasts of Israel point to Yeshua, point to the Messiah. Thank God it's Labor Day. Amen. Um, and we've just kind of been laboring through this book, even though it's short, there's so much to unpack in this book. It's so beautiful. Um, I am, I'm an, I'm an Instagram. I actually had an Instagram. I deleted it. I had a lot of followers. I was, it was, Instagram is so vain, so I deleted it. Um, I'll take some questions now if you guys want to chit chat, but I just made a new one actually. It's at Real Anna Kate. But I, I'm doing it for the God, the Lord's glory. I really hate, I'm telling you, I hate Instagram. There's some, I just really don't like it. But um, I started following a bunch of Christians on it and it's just been a blessing and I'm just like allowing the Lord to just use social media platform to reach people with the gospel. And even though I really don't like Instagram and I always delete it, um, I just, I'm just going to use it for him and glorify him and put Psalms on it and all that. So <laughs> yeah, 
I'm gonna probably keep it, but yeah. for his honor and for his glory. Yeah, so good. Anything else that I missed? So what'd you guys think? Any Feast of Tabernacles will, yeah, will be the next fulfilled. That's right. And I can't wait till the Feast of the Trumpets. Size return. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for sharing. Of course, such a great book. Oh, by the way, I have a surprise for you. I have a surprise for you. I have a surprise for you. Okay, so <laughs> since I try, I try to do this because um, the father is such a great gift giver. I love to do random gifts also, and I love to give. So this is one of my favorite books. And I want to give it to one of you guys. So if you retweet, retweet, so because I want people, I want non-believers to watch this and get interested in the Bible and, you know, seeing how good God is because people think in the Old Testament, God is such a wrathful, angry God. No, he warns his people, don't do this or this is going to happen. Don't do this or this will happen. Um, I don't want to do this to you, but please turn back to me. Please repent. So for those that have stuck till the end, um, I'm going to give this book away. It's called Tactics by George Kokel. This is a great Christian apologetics book. Fantastic. It's literally, in my opinion, the best. Have to read it. It's so good. I'm going to randomly um, give it to someone who retweets this Periscope on Twitter or on Facebook. It's also going on Facebook and I'll DM you. So make sure you're following me or you have your DM open so I can DM you. I want to send you this book uh, as a gift. So you know, and I'm, I'm not trying to bribe you to read the word, but it's just like, no, it, you, you're here. You love the Lord. The Lord is a great gift giver. And I, he's going to give this to you. This is from him. This is from him. So, amen. I hope you guys enjoyed tea. Amen. I'm, gonna, I'm reading your comments on Periscope. <laughs> guys, I think I need to get a uh, iPad. And you, can you guys recommend what iPad you y'all recommend because I want to be able to read your comments and I just have a computer and a phone. Praise God. My phone has a lag for some reason, but amen. God is good. God keeps his promises. He is faithful. Hallelujah. 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 Man. What I'm also planning to do, so we are having this Bible study every Monday and Wednesday from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern time. I'm going to keep it the same. And um, the next book we're going to jump into, I actually want to jump in to a few. So we did a whole book. We did Esther, the whole book. But we're going to do next time is we're going to, I want to go through some of the gospel, a few chapters um, and dissect it. Some great stuff there. But then after a few chapters in the gospel, we're going to jump into Romans, Romans 1. And we're going to do every chapter till Revelation. So we'll probably do like three or four chapters in each sitting to go through it to get to um, Revelation. And then we'll come back around and we'll go to the Old Testament and go through the end time study so we can do that as well uh there's so much to dissect and, and unpack and as you guys know i am studying the word and it's so fun to study together as well to get together to study uh like i said last time i'm gonna invite some of you guys watching to join in as well i'm gonna try to figure out a feature of having either you call in or a video but i don't really want it to lag the stream because for some reason it's a little laggy when i do too much um, but what did you guys say? What's your questions? Oh, my nine-year-old wanted me to tell you, God bless you, and she's enjoying this. Well, God bless you, nine-year-old. Gosh, that's so cool that you're listening to the Bible at your age. I am telling you, I wish I was listening to the Bible at your age, sweetheart. Man, I made so many mistakes because I didn't listen to God and I didn't read his word. So your parents are awesome for having you watch and read the word of God. There's nothing better. There's nothing better than God's promises and the, and man, his, his word. 
God bless you. God bless you. I know a lot of you are going to leave in a little bit. Um, I just want to get to some of your questions, if anything. And uh, what tea are you enjoying? Okay. I did this in the beginning of the stream. It is black tea. Passion fruit. Passion fruit black tea. I love this tea. And actually, oh, this is what I wanted to say as well. I use tea leaves. I love tea leaves. I don't use the tea bags because from what I've heard, they're like leftover stuff. And I love, that's why I love fresh tea leaves. And I got this tea. It's not sponsored. I'm just, I'm telling you because I love it. I got this awesome glass teapot, which I absolutely adore. And I have my little glass teacup. <laughs> and I, you know, this, I drink a lot of tea. I'm Russian. We drink a lot of tea. Chai, we drink a lot of chai. So this is a good one. And I'll have different teas every time. So it'll be like a cute little tea time, lunch time, hangout time to study the word, to sit together. <laughs> Um, amen. His word does not return void. It will accomplish his will, which is what we see in this book. We see that in this book. We see that throughout the whole Bible, that, Eve, that Yahweh promised his people, the Jewish people, that he was going to send the Messiah and that he was going, that the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15, Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman will trample on the seed of the serpent. <clears throat> and that is exactly what, uh, you know, Jesus, Yeshua, HaMashiach did. And that even, and Satan, and I'm sure you've seen it in the middle, if you guys were here since in the middle and in the beginning, that Satan constantly tries to annihilate God's will and has tried to annihilate his promises by trying to annihilate his people who were going to bring the Messiah. And Satan has tried with Haman to annihilate the Jews, tried with Hitler. Well, actually Hitler came later, but tried it with the Pharaoh, tried it with Herod. And he, Satan is unsuccessful because God's promises, he's faithful. And uh, he, God is, God's sovereign. So uh, he is omnipotent, omnipotent. He keeps his promise. Oh, what app was I using? I was using NKJV. It's called the audio. Gosh, what is it called? It's called the Word of Promise app. Fantastic app. It's an audio theater. So you're listening to the entire Bible NKJV, which is, which is a great version. Um, and it's the audible theater, theater of hundreds of actors who are Christian, probably, um, who are uh, reading the whole Bible. It's fantastic. There's sound effects you heard and everything. So it's a great, great app. And if you get Audible for the first time, you get three books free. So that was my first book that I got. And man, it's so good. They all, it also comes in CDs. There's, you also have an app. Um, who uses CDs anymore? But I do. Um, yeah okay amen yeah romans we're gonna get to romans i can't wait till we do romans galatians we're gonna go through all of that yeah we're gonna jump into the you know after acts jump into romans like get into the heart of it yeah although the gospel and acts is also the heart of it it's all so good amen occasional city sounds outside definitely adds to the broadcast i know i'm so sorry it does i i live in new york and it's very loud i am moving out of new york next year so you have to bear with me until next year guys because it's loud i hate it i'm over it i'm done with it i'm out of here very soon i just need a few more properties that need to sell i am a real estate broker in new york and man, the market is slow, and I promised some of my really good friends to sell their properties and then I can leave, so I kind of stuck here until then. Um, but the Lord told me I'm leaving next year, so amen. I'm excited. Um, okay, type the name of the app. Sure, it's called Words of, the Word of Promise. Either Word or Word, Word of Promise. Word of Promise app. It's called the Audio Theater app. Word of Promise on Audible, the app Audible for uh, books. 
Okay, Matt, it adds to the broadcast. I mean, ambulance, fire trucks. I mean, it's real. We're live. <laughs> Amen. So when, oh, here, I have one more thing. One more thing I want to say. So what I'm really excited about, too, is that we're not just going to go through the word. We're also going to go through two documents I want to go through. One is architectural evidence of the Bible. I have this fantastic extra biblical you know, source, uh, which I have on my Twitter, where it goes through a lot of the history of the Bible in terms of architectural evidence, because I want atheists to be able to watch it as well. So we're going to do a stream on that. And then the second stream I want to do in the middle of like all of this great Bible study is uh, I have a wonderful PDF of all of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and Jesus fulfilling it in the New Testament. So we're going to go through that PDF and I'm really excited to go through it. I'm going to invite some of my Jewish friends to tune in and watch, my Jewish family to tune in and watch because we're going to go through it. There's over 100 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled right down to where he was born in Bethlehem, Egypt, um, betrayals, piercings, all of that. But we're gonna go through that document. It's really good. And if you want actually that document before we even go through it, the PDF, message me, and, uh, send me an email. Send. So for those who want this PDF that I'm talking about, there's no copyright on it. It comes from this book that's no copyright. You can use it for studies. We are going to go through it. If you have anyone you wanna send it to beforehand, if you wanna look through it beforehand, send me an email to Kate, my last name, K-H-A-I-T, <coughs> which is Jewish, your last name, Kate, or Chayit in Hebrew, kate.anna at yahoo.com. If you send me an email, kate.anna, A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, at yahoo.com, send me an email, hey, can you send me that PDF of prophecies of Jesus? I will email it to you and uh, go through it. And we are going to go through it one day as well. It's a great PDF. I've sent it to some Jewish friends of mine uh, one of them was actually, you know, wondering about Jesus and I sent him the document and he came over my house and he was like, he was, he was shocked and he brought the document to, I also went through the entire old Testament, all the prophecies of the Messiah. Literally we were together for about four and a half hours and went through every single scripture, probably missed a few, but <coughs> we went through a lot and he took that document. You're welcome in advance. He took that document and he brought it to his rabbis and he, his rabbi, and he said, uh, Rabbi, here's this document, all the prophecies of, of the Messiah, and here's all the prophecies of Jesus that he fulfilled. And um, the rabbi, you know what he said to him? He was like, ah, oh, don't, don't ignore that. Don't look at it. I suggest you not talk to Anna again, you know, get rid of her, like cut her off. And my friend, came to me and call, called me actually, and he was like, uh, this is what he said. <clears throat> I am very uncomfortable that there are no answers. This is like overwhelming. He said, I'm overwhelmed. Thank you, kate.anayahoo.com, thank you. My friend said, I'm overwhelmed by how many prophecies Jesus fulfilled. No one in history has ever fulfilled it. And in Zechariah, it said, when the Messiah is gonna come, he's gonna come between, um, between the building of the first temple and in between, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, the, the first temple until, little up, no, second temple and it being destroyed. So he's going to come right after the second temple and right before it's destroyed. Zechariah, I think it's Zechariah 9 from what I remember. But so, the, the, you know, the, the, the Israel who's waiting for their Messiah, uh, that time has passed. That, the Messiah had to have come before the destruction of the second temple, which already happened which Jesus, again, fulfilled all the prophecies. But the time is coming, Zechariah 12, 10, where Israel will realize they killed their Messiah. And, you know, it, praise God, honestly, that they did because it was the will of the Father for him to die and to die for all of our sins. Because if Jesus didn't die, we wouldn't have been saved and we wouldn't have been, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We wouldn't have been able to come to the Father. You know, he was our bridge, so praise God for Jesus. So anyway, we're gonna go through that document. It's fantastic, you're gonna love it. Uh, oh yeah, so I'll 
tell, finish this thing and then we'll cut this off. I know you guys have been here for a while and I can rant, but um, so my so my Jewish friend took that document to the rabbis. He said, ignore it, don't talk to her anymore. Came to me and said, uh, I don't feel comfortable with this. It's overwhelming what to do with this document. I am curious and I wanna study more. I said, go for it, study the word study the word. I said, the most important thing is having an open mind. Redeemed was the word I was looking for. Thank you. Have an open mind. And, um, he did have an open mind and he actually ended up getting saved. He is now a born again, Christian or born again, you know, messianic Jew. Uh, so praise God. I'm technically a messianic Jew as well because I'm half Jewish, but yeah well, praise god for this bible study thank you guys for joining again for those who are going to retweet this because <laughs> i want to share the word of god for everyone to, to to watch this to read this but um this is a great christian apologetics book i will send it to one of you i will send you a dm so if you retweet this on facebook or twitter i will send you a dm send you a book it's from the lord it's a great book frank Turek uses it all the time if you watch david wood on YouTube who is a great uh, Christian apologetic as well, who knows Islam very well and always debates Muslim leaders um, and, sh and, and sheiks and all of that. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> I've been talking, my voice is itchy now. Yeah, awesome. I'm just reading your comments. Yeah, Isaiah 53, they also ignore. Uh, but that's why I have my family in prayer. I keep my family in prayer of a lot of family um, in Israel as well. and. Uh, you know, a lot of them are not believers and some of them are, you know, they just don't know the Messiah yet who died for them as well. So glory to God, they will be saved in Jesus name. Amen. You're welcome. <laughs> Toda. Toda. Tov. Tov means good. I know a little bit of Hebrew. It's so funny. A bit. Okay. God bless you. Such a blessing to be with you all. Such a blessing to have this Bible study. Again, I also recommend this book. Really fantastic. <coughs> Unlocking the Bible. David Pawson. Context, historical background. I, again, I'm not sponsored. I don't know these guys, but it, it helps me study. I love studying the word. I love studying with you. I'm so happy you guys are all here studying together. Have a blessed Labor Day. I love you guys so much. I'm gonna finish this tea. Okay, I love tea. And I will see you guys next time for tea time and our Bible study. God bless you.